and welcome to this episode of Kitties in the Kitchen. I'm your host, Melissa Prest, a registered dietitian nutritionist with the National Kidney Foundation of Illinois. And with me today is our guest, Renee Fung, who is also a registered dietitian and works with people um, on dialysis. Hello. Hello. Thanks for being here with us Thanks today. Thanks for having me. Of course. So today's episode is all about cultural foods or working in a CKD or kidney diet, um, being culturally sensitive to kind of those favorites that a lot of people have that aren't maybe necessarily typically seen in our food list that patients get a lot of times of. Um, so, you know, kind of thinking through, you know, when you're working with people that have diverse backgrounds and ethnicities and cultures, what are some of the first things that you, um, you know, you do when you're working with someone like that? Right. Yeah. And first of all, I do work with um, a wide variety of population who comes from different backgrounds, who follow different types of diets. So sometimes it can be very challenging because information online can be so general mm -hmm. and it's not really cultural specific. Right. And so the first thing that I do usually is I make sure that my patient trusts me. They need to be 100% relying on me, make sure that they understand that I'm here to help. There's no judgment here mm -hmm. because that's the only way for me to understand what their diet is like. Right. And then secondly, once I understand um, what their diet pattern is like, usually I ask them what they ate yesterday from morning to night. Mm -hmm. Then I kind of understand, okay, this is th these are some of the things that you eat. These are some of the things that you don't eat. Right. And that, that's how then I start giving some of the suggestions. Okay, great. Is there anything, I know when I was working with people that were on dialysis, a lot of times we talked about maybe taking photos of, of some of the food options or foods that they were choosing or getting family involved. Um, you know, do you see families kind of being involved a little bit more to kind of help when you're working with people? Yeah, for these issues. Um, it depends on um, the person. Sometimes it can be difficult for people to take photos because it's they don't always remember. Mm -hmm. um, most of the time, I tend to ask them to write down mm -hmm. what they ate, um, so then I can understand. And I also ask a lot of questions. Sure. Um, what about this? What about that? Um, tell me more, yeah. and then that's how I get more information yeah. from them. Because even though if they tell me they follow like a, a Asian diet, mm -hmm. it can be so general. Of course. You know, it, uh, patient A and patient B can both be following like an Asian diet, but it can be just so right. different. <laughs> right. It can be vegetarian. They yep. can, this can be like not eating meat or anything like that. Yeah. So. Yeah. Very different depending on a region or, you know, wherever that area is that, you know, someone might be from. Are there any commonalities that you find just in general with, um, you know, various cultural foods? So I know I had a patient once who went to Mexico on an extended trip to Mexico and came back and his lab values were actually better than when he was, you know, just living his life normally here. And I think some of it had to do with um, just the, the lifestyle and the foods that he was eating in Mexico, which were maybe a little bit more traditional for him than what he was getting here. Um, so any commonalities that you normally, you know, can kind of see sometimes with some of the different diets or, mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe it needs some big differences. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, American diet consists of, um, it has a huge part of, of like fast food in them. Mm -hmm. So versus some other country, they might not be consuming so much fast food. Right. So it might be one of the reasons why uh, the example that you provided, you know, yep. that their numbers look better. Um, but overall, what I tell people to do is no matter what kind of diet you're following, it all comes down to the same fundamental nutrition um, compounds, which are carbohydrate, protein, and fats. Mm -hmm. So one of the most important thing is no matter what kind of diet you're following, so important to learn about how to identify what kind of food on your plate is considered as the carbohydrate, what kind of food is considered as the protein, and what kind of food considered as the fat. Mm -hmm. And from that, a big part of Reno diet is also um, has to do with portion control. Let's say if someone is following like a high protein diet, then no matter what culture that diet that you're following, if you are able to identify which part of it is carb, which part of it is protein and fat, you can easily just increase double, double portion the protein that you're eating and decrease on the carbohydrate and fat that you're eating. And that way you won't be gaining any weight and at the same time you have succeeded with a high protein diet. Sure. No, that makes sense. And I think that's like a nice simplistic way to 
to look at it? Is that yeah. where you know, kind of just breaking it down to all the all of the diets, no matter which one you're you're looking at, are going to have those basic elements to it. Um, it's just different foods fit within that protein category or carbohydrate category. So for instance, rice might be one that's very common in, in certain diets. So that would fit the carbohydrate category or beans might be something that's very common or lentils. And so that kind of actually goes in two categories in a way, you've got a little bit of that protein, but then also carbohydrates. So <clears throat> Exactly. So yeah, it's always just kind of figure out like, like you said, um, you know, kind of what part does that fit into and then how are we going to portion that out? Yeah. And that is one reason why I don't really like um, writing out a fixed meal plan yeah. for anyone just because there's so many things that can happen in that one day that it, it, it might not be possible to follow that uh, strict um Meal, meal plan that you have in front of you. And the key here is to make sure, is to learn how to how to cope in different situations. If you're traveling, you know, your different food that is in front of you, what can I do to make sure that I am still following my diet? Yeah, absolutely. And I, you know, and I, I think that's one thing too with like holidays, you know, when holidays are coming up and there's always special foods that maybe it is a holiday that they wouldn't normally eat. Um, or anyone would normally eat. Um, yeah. So that's another way that kind of navigating that. Um, what types of tips or tricks do you give your patients in terms of navigating those cultural foods at, at like a holiday time? Mm -hmm. So um, one important thing I stress is make sure you understand what which kidney diet you're following because even though person A and person B are both on dialysis, their diet can be so different. Maybe you need a high phosphorus diet, maybe you need a low phosphorus diet. Understand what kind of diet you're following and then try to study um, the food that is in front of you. I like to tell people that the internet is a really nice resource because let's say if you're following a low phosphorus diet, and there is a mango in front of you. You don't know how much phosphorus in that mango. Right. But if you just type in your phone milligrams of phosphorus in a mango, it will give you like a general idea mm -hmm. of how much there is. Mm -hmm. Then if you know, let's say you're restricted to 800 to 1,000 a day, then you know, okay, I can enjoy this mango, but maybe not too much, or this is how much I can eat. Right, right. Yeah. And I think that's just like, you would brought that up with like meal plans and just the issue in general that I always find with meal plans or lists. I think a lot of people, ask for that or they'll, you know, they kind of ask for the dietitian, oh, I want this list or can you give me this meal or this diet? And I think what happens, like you said, you know, it looks nice on paper and you spend a lot of time doing it, but then it's not necessarily as very practical because um, stuff comes up. Maybe they're working and there's an event that comes up or now there's a family function and it didn't fit with the meal plan and then there's stress about that. So, um, you know, a lot of times it is kind of thinking through more simple ways of like, how can you just make a healthy plate in any situation that you're in. And the same with the food list, like you said, like you may or may not need to restrict certain foods that are on a food list that you might find on the internet or in, like in a doctor's office or whatever. So they're, they're kind of these general tools to help you, but it may not necessarily be specific to you, which is always why it's great to talk with your dietitian. Um, you know, if you are on dialysis in your dialysis center, um, you know, or throughout community resources to connect with the dietitian. So um, that's really good, really good yeah. points. And yeah. then one example is, um, and I also understand why people ask for meal plans, because sure. it's very difficult to just tell them this is what you do. They want one like a guideline to yeah. follow. Yeah. And so I did that once for one of my clients. And then the next day they called me and basically said, um, I did meal prep, but then before I go to work, I actually forgot to bring my my lunch box. So what do I do now? Yeah. So now then I start educating them. This is what you need to do. Right. Tell me what would you do in this situation. And right. that's how people learn. And that's yeah. how one day you uh, fully understand what a kidney diet is. Yeah, absolutely. No, I think that's really great advice. Um, trying to think through some other questions we were talking about. Um, in terms of just kind of maybe modifying maybe some recipes or modifying, you know, kind of 
what's presented, what types of things do you recommend to patients about that? Mm -hmm. um, so generally speaking, if somebody is following like a low phosphorus diet, um, if their recipe calls for chocolate, I would kind of suggest what about a different flavor? You know, how about vanilla, how about strawberry? just because chocolate is high in phosphorus. Right. Um, or if the recipe calls for cheese, how about a cheese that is lower in phosphorus, like um, cream cheese, uh, cottage cheese, mm -hmm. feta cheese? Um, or can you just take out the cheese? Or what about another fat? Would it still produce the same effect? And if it comes to you think that any modification will make the food so different, it's unacceptable, mm -hmm. just make it the way it is, enjoy it, but watch the amount of um, intake that you're, you're, you're consuming. Right. Um, we, at the end of the day, we want everyone to be able to enjoy food, um, but you know, just look into how much phosphorus there is, and if it's too high, have small portion of it. The rest of the day, maybe go with extra low phosphorus diet, and maybe take some extra binder, talk to your doctor. Mm -hmm. um, there are many ways to do it. Yeah, and I know Ann and I will go to our website, um, one second, I will pull that up. This is the recipe that we're gonna make in a little later on, so that'll be good. So we'll get out of that really quickly. Um, but if you go to the National Kidney Foundation of Illinois website, it's a great resource and it can take you to other resources that are out there in terms of looking for that information in terms of, well, what foods have phosphorus? What foods have potassium? What foods, you know, would maybe be more considered a protein. So, um, you know, you can look through on the website and you can find different information um, on here. And also, like I said, it will also link you back to um, some other websites as well that can, that can help you out. So we'll get out of this one and then we will pull back up the recipe. There we go. Okay, so any other thoughts or anything else that, you know, kind of just in general of sort of thinking through um, maybe some challenges that maybe some patients have brought to you about, you know, just the information that they're given or things that they're able to find, um, you know, what kind of challenges are, yeah. do you see? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so one suggestion I at times I ask my, my, my clients, patients to do is also, you know, if they're able to find any material that are in their language. Mm -hmm. Because the internet is, is so nice because it's worldwide. Um, it's not just the US, everyone all around the world upload information on there. Mm -hmm. So I, I had um, successfully find some material in Chinese for my patients and that were they were made by um, a dialysis center in, in China. And so it provide excellent um, examples, different recipes um, for my patients, but of course I have to make sure that that is the diet that they're following. Right. Um, and also just, just always start Googling different food that you're wondering how many phosphorus there is and how much potassium is in there. Mm -hmm. Through that you're going to learn so much that maybe after a month just by looking at that food you're going to be able to see, oh okay I remember this, I, I should have a smaller amount of this, oh this is fine, I can have more. Mm -hmm. um, so the internet is, is, is a very useful resource. Sure. Yeah. sure. And I know the um, USDA.gov is one of the places where a lot of the food information comes from for like food labels and recipes. A lot of times it will come from that database and that is something that everyone has access to. So you can always look up, you know, food items on that as well to kind of figure out how much potassium and phosphorus and, and protein are in different food items. Um, you know, I, lo I know a lot of times with the manufacturer, food manufacturers and food products, a lot of times those change often. So, you know, just depending on a recipe or if they're kind of changing up the formulation of a product, you may find different levels of phosphorus and potassium in them so it's kind of always good to always like check you know the labels when you are you know looking at things now I know potassium is on the food label um, phosphorus isn't always on a food label but we can um, kind of just show you on the we have here we can kind of take a look at the food label if you want to grab that and we can do the overhead and just kind of look at that food label 
So you can kind of see, let's see, we can zoom in a little closer. Nope, that's out. Okay. That's the closest. Okay. So on here, um, I think potassium's on there, right? We can see that. Um, usually potassium might be listed under... Um, like a percent Maybe daily the, value. Yeah. I know like on the newer food labels, it's something no. that's going to be listed now, you know, probably going forward. So this may be an older label, but a lot of the products going forward should have potassium listed on it. Mm -hmm. um, and then phosphorus, if you do see phosphorus on the label, well, most likely you might find it in the ingredient list. So you might see it as like a phosphorus. No, no, this is just a plain yogurt. So what we see on that is just that it's just cultured whole milk or not, sorry, low fat milk. Um, and then it has the different um, cultures. cultures in it for to make it yogurt. So that is in that one. But that's where you can kind of also just look up information too if you're kind of in the grocery store looking at things. And there's always, like you said, different apps and different things that um, one can look at to find yeah. that information out. And that's the benefit too because we are in the U.S. So any foreign ingredients, um, you know, food products that are um, sold in the U.S., it's mandatory for them to have a food label in English. So it should be easy, uh, readily available for us to look at how much protein is in there, how much potassium. Great. So um, what are we making today? Yeah, so I'm making a yogurt drink today. It's called Iron. I was actually just in Turkey two weeks ago. Okay. And I, w I saw everyone is drinking either a Turkish tea or this white drink. So then I asked, what is this? Mm -hmm. And the waiter told me it's Iron. It's a yogurt drink. Mm. And I tasted it and I fell in love with oh, it. Okay. And now I am very addicted to it. <laughs> um, yogurt is very high in protein. So I right. think it's an excellent choice for our uh, uh uh, patients who are on dialysis to consume. And also with the fluid restriction, this drink mm -hmm. is also a nice thirst quencher. Mm -hmm. And then I think too with the cultures, we kind of mentioned those. Um, those are always just good for good gut health. And yes. so that's always something I know with people that are on dialysis, that that's sometimes a, a complaint or an issue is just kind of different GI distress and problems. So having really good um, intake of probiotics and prebiotics, um, you know, really do help with gut health. So that's another benefit of yogurt as well. Yes. So I will pull up the, the ingredients so we can kind of talk through them. It's really a very simple recipe. Very simple. Um, and today we don't actually have a blender. So you don't always necessarily need to have a blender. There's other ways that you can make this. So we have a, a non-blender way to make it. Yes. So, and I really like this recipe because it's so simple. So whenever we're on a go, we can just make this in two minutes and have it to go. All right. So let's take a look and put this together. All right. So it's a two to one ratio. Um, today, um, the yo yogurt that we're using is a Greek yogurt. So what I'm going to do is easier way. I'm going to put um, two of these yogurts in this bowl. Then I will know then that I need one of these of water to add in there because and, it's a two-in-one ratio. And any yogurt would work. Any Greek yogurt would work. It is a little higher in protein. It's a little bit thicker. It's like more of a custardy yes. kind of than um, some like of a traditional kind of yogurt that some people might think about. But any any brand, any type would work. Um, yeah, and we use plain yogurt this way um, because a lot of flavored yogurt also has a lot of added sugar. Right. So this way we can kind of um, limit the amount of added sugar in our drink. And then I'm going to add water. You can use milk as well, but personally, I think it's already thick enough for me to consume. And I just enjoy the way it is. Um, if you have a blender, if you want to, if you like mint flavor, um, I've also tried to um, throw in some fresh mint in there um, and then just blend it all together until it's smooth. So right now I'm just going to whisk this so that um, it will become a little more frothy. It's kind of like kefir almost. It's just yes, like yes, yes, yes. yes. Yeah, and I just like plain yogurt too because it is there's really no added sugars in it, and so it's nice to just add in some 
You can add in frozen fruit or some fresh fruit to kind of give that sweetness、right. without having the added sugars. Yeah, and of course, if you want, you can. If you have a blender, you can also add in any kind of fruit, fruit to it to add some flavor. But that's completely up to what you want to do. And actually, the traditional iron requires salt. To be added to it, but because we usually kidney patient、um, dialysis patients needs to be on a sodium restriction diet,、um, I am not using any sodium today, and I still I think that it tastes as good. So, do you want to pour it that way, or do you want to use the measuring cup? Yes, let me use the measuring cup so it's I don't spill. <laughs> it's, okay. it's always it's always a challenge trying to <laughs> do things in a studio versus at home. But we make it work. Yep. This one. These glasses are really cute. Yeah, I got them when I was in Turkey. I love them. They're good for tea, any drinks.、Um, and then, if you like, you can also sprinkle some、um, cinnamon on top. It looks so pretty. It's so pretty. And if you like it to be thicker, you can add more yogurt. If you like it to be thinner, you can add more water. So up to you. See the little cinnamon in it. Yay! Cheers! Cheers! <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm gonna taste this because yeah, it smells delicious. I love cinnamon. Yeah, me too. Hmm. It's good. Yeah. So for yeah. those who are not used to the taste of plain yogurt. It might take a little time to get used to the taste, yeah. But、um, after a while, a lot of people just fall in love with it, and you might even drink it every day. Yeah, yeah. It's got like a little tartness, like you get a little like cheeks pucker up with it. So I definitely can see you can add some fruit to make it a little sweeter, like you said, and kind of blend it up. And, and again, even if you don't have a blender and you have frozen fruit, you can just smash the frozen fruit in that too. Yes.、Um, so that would work because sometimes I frozen fruit in general is always a little bit. Like softer, I think, than if you got just fresh fruit.、Um, so it's easy to kind of smash that up, get a little little、yeah. different flavor. Yeah, and you and can、sweetness. even、um, add ice to it, so that in the summertime it's a really refreshing drink. Yeah. Well, I love it. Thanks. Thank you. So, any further tips or anything else you want to leave our viewers with here today? Yeah.、Um, so, most importantly,、um, first thing is make sure that you understand what type of kidney diet are you following. Secondly, start analyzing your food—the food that you're eating.、Um, kind of break them, break them down into like: is it a carb? Is it a protein or fat?、Um, and then just slowly start doing modification in your diet, and you will be able to enjoy any food that you like. But at the same time, it's、uh, good for your health. I love it. Simple and easy. Yes. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you for having me. Of course, and we'll see you next time. See you.